Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for raising your health IQ with us in more than 130 countries around the world, making the Exam Room one of the most downloaded nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And today's question is this, could the food being served in hospitals actually be making you sicker? You think about this. You go to the hospital because you've had a heart attack, because you're fighting cancer, unfortunately. You've got any one of these chronic diseases, and the food that is being served there may very well, in fact, be the food that brought you there in the first place, and then making you sicker still while you are there. And perhaps there is no more glaring example of this than when triple cheeseburgers and fries are being served in the lobby at fast food restaurants. So how big of a problem is this? Well, we are going to be talking today with Dr. Sarai Stancic. She is studying this extensively. The phenomenon of having these fast food restaurants inside hospitals and hospital food, then making you sicker. Dr. Stancic, thank you for being here today. Um, Obviously, we talk a lot about healthy food on the exam room, but I don't think that a person needs necessarily to be really hyper ingrained in the nutrition world to understand that fast food probably is not the healthiest food. And then it's not a stretch then to wonder, well, why then would it be served in the house of health, a.k.a. Right. a hospital? Right. It's perplexing, right? I, you know, this has been an area of interest for me, Chuck, for many years. Um, it began back when I was in medical school, believe it or not, almost 30 years ago, for whatever reason, uh, the administrators at the hospital, which was affiliated with my medical school in Newark, New Jersey's University Hospital Tertiary Care Center, they decided to place a Burger King within the four walls of the hospital. Uh, and I thought that was extraordinary at the time. And it's bad enough, this is an inner city community drowning in chronic disease, diabetes, obesity, heart disease. And it's encased, the facility itself is encased with fast food restaurants. Across the street, there's McDonald's, the Checkers, Dunkin' Donut, all of it. But to put this Burger King within the hospital is what really, uh, I have to say, enraged me. And I couldn't believe it was happening. The very same foods that are fueling, as you said, the admissions to the hospital now within the four walls of the institution. And I remember reaching out to administrators and sort of bringing attention to this. This is unacceptable. We know that it is this unhealthy, poor uh, diet, the standard American diet, you know, laden in saturated fat and cholesterol. Um, foods deficient in fiber that are fueling the chronic disease epidemic, and how could it be acceptable that we have this in our hospital? And for years, you know, I spoke to this and with little attention. And it wasn't until about 2015 that I actually reached out to Dr. Barnard, um, explaining my frustration with the president of this uh, Burger King. And at the same time, I had done a little bit of research and learned that PCRM had looked at this problem on on a national scale and had identified that there were indeed, because I thought maybe it's just our hospital, but there were indeed several uh, fast food restaurants in hospitals across the country. And so when I reached out to Dr. Barnard, he offered to help. And so the first step was to gain a copy of the contract. And when we when we did that, we learned that the, the restaurant, um, there was a contract renewal every five years. And we knew that the next time up for renewal was 2020. So we set up um, a protest in 2019, and we also collected um, a petition, names in, in a petition, bringing attention to this. And lo and behold, all of this advocacy actually um, served a great purpose because the, the CEO sort of um, realized at that point that we needed to end this relationship. So the good news is, is that the Burger King at University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey ended, and that's wonderful. But we have a universal problem across the country. Um, there was a paper that was published in 2006 by a physician named Leonard Lesser. And what he did was he uh, asked each medical school to respond to the survey. So one student per medical school responded. And the question was this, do any of the hospitals through which you rotate, on average, most medical schools rotate through five or six medical school, um, uh, hospitals. Do any of these hospitals house a fast food restaurant? And believe it or not, Dr. Lesser reported that 63% of U.S. medical schools were affiliated 
with an academic institution, a hospital that housed a fast food restaurant, which is when I read that, um, I found it to be extraordinary. And so we're working uh, toward bringing attention to these fast food restaurants. We want to end these relationships whenever possible and, and replace those fast food restaurants with healthy uh, environments. And this is such a teaching, uh, a teachable moment. Imagine if you have a patient who's admitted to the hospital, status post heart attack, right? And instead of feeding them bacon and eggs, which is happening every day across our country uh, in hospital settings, that we instead um, present them with a beautiful, colorful plant-based dish. And we use that opportunity to teach them about the importance of those phytonutrients and the fiber content in that dish and how it's serving them to not only prevent another event, but to also potentially reverse disease. Um, these are extraordinary moments uh, and opportunities for us to convey to the public how important it is, uh, what their dietary choices are. I, I, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, <laughs> but but before we, we go any further, like I, I just want to quantify the importance of this. So we're talking about all of these chronic diseases that are preventable. Obviously, fast food is a huge part of the standard American diet that is driving a lot of these chronic diseases. So by and large, without getting into the specifics of this disease or that disease, what percentage of all of these chronic diseases would you say is in fact preventable if people were eating a healthier diet? Yeah, well, I mean, we have ample evidence, Chuck, that speaks to this. We know that uh, nearly 80% of chronic diseases are preventable by modifying our, our lifestyles in a comprehensive way. So yes, diet is, 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 is primary, but it's also assuring that patients are engaging in physical activity, that they're sleeping effectively, that they're addressing their stress. But diet is... Uh, uh, undeniably the most important decision each and every one of us makes each day. So that's why it's so important that these dots are connected, that our healthcare institutions uh, relay these uh, messages to our community. Currently, they are not. They are falling short. There are institutions where um, good good advances are being made and, are, and they're setting good examples. Um, and we highlight them and we celebrate them, but they're the minority. We need to make this uh, universally uh, um, uh, sound that, that all hospitals represent healthy hospital environment, healthy food environments so that we can, we can uh, make a big difference in, in so many of these chronic diseases. All right. Uh, and, and so then let me ask you this. You're talking about 80% of these diseases being preventable uh, by making those diet and lifestyle changes. Um, what then would be the upside for the hospital to serve these foods that are continuing to drive this disease epidemic? That's a really great question. I, th I think regrettably, um, some decisions are made for financial reasons. I suppose that many of these fast food restaurants are profitable uh, and they may, for that reason, uh, be the reason why they're still there. But um, we have to do the right thing here. And, you know, at some point, uh, that's what we talked about this earlier. Uh, at some point, we allowed smoking in hospitals. And, and it wasn't, believe it or not, in, it, it was 1964 when the Surgeon General uh, produced a report based on 10,000 studies that smoking was deleterious to our health. But it wasn't until, believe it or not, 1993 that there was a universal standard created by the Joint Commission that required all hospitals to go smoke free. Um, and I always tell my medical students, and they don't believe me when I tell them, but when I was when I started medical school, you could actually still smoke in hospitals. Uh, and it took great effort. Um, but finally, we are we've arrived at a time that that uh, smoking is no longer acceptable, not only in hospitals, but it's no and I never thought I'd see the day where you can't smoke in a bar. I mean, and 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 that's wonderful. We so we've made incredible progress. But today, uh, our food is the current day cigarette. Uh, and we need to bring attention to this and assure that hospital administrators uh, address this lapse in, in, in health care. Because I think if we do this, we can create a shift in paradigm uh, and, and it will serve the message that we have here at PCRM, the importance of diet and the role that it plays, not only in disease prevention, but also in, in maintenance of health. 
All right. So if food is the modern day cigarette and 63% of medical schools are affiliated with a hospital that does have fast food, what type of message is that sending to medical students? We already know that there is little to no nutrition education within the medical school curriculum. So, right. I mean, what kind of message now is being sent? It's a terrible message. I mean, nutrition education is, is part of my main initiative here at PCRM. Uh, you know, today, Chuck, the average medical school delivers about 19 hours of nutrition education over four years. And that is largely biochemistry and vitamin deficiencies. It's not clinical nutrition. It's not connecting the dots between why this, this poor standard American diet is fueling the diabetes and obesity epidemic. So there's this incredible lapse. And then they, they rotate through uh, uh, these hospitals and they see this. They see this. They're going into this cafeteria and they, they see the presence of these fast food restaurants. So what does that tell them? This is acceptable. And guess who's online with them? Other doctors. And um, not only is it a bad example for, for the medical students, what a bad example it is for our patients, right? I mean, we see our patients leaving the diabetes clinic or the heart disease clinic and coming down to the cafeteria for lunch. And this is what they're fueling on, the very same food that brought them to the diabetes clinic. And, and um, I, I, I remain perplexed as to how it is that today in 2022, uh, the great majority of um, hospitals are, are allowing this to occur uh, uh, unanswered. And so um, we, we need, this is why we are shedding light on this. And, you know, the number that I quoted in Lesser's study, that was 2006. And the reason I want to repeat the survey, and which is what we're doing now at PCRM, we're repeating the very same survey. So we're, we're questioning one medical student uh, from each medical school. Please complete the survey and let us know. We want to know where we are today. Have we learned in the past 15 years? Have we, have we moved forward? Are, are many of these relationships uh, have they ended? Are we replacing them with better options? We don't know. So that's why we want to repeat it today, see where we are. And maybe in some parts of the country, we've we've made drastic improvement. And then maybe other countries are, are parts of the country we're lagging behind. But we want to shed light on where those lapses are so that we can create meaningful change and we can have dialogue uh, with those administrators in hopes that they will see the light and, and create a healthy food environment for their community and patients. Yeah, I'd be interesting to I'd be interested to know what type of progress has been made since the original study. Um, and in that initial study, what kind of connection was there, if any, uh, between the areas where there were the most fast food, uh, restaurants within hospitals and the obesity rate. So were there more likely to be uh, like Burger Kings, as you said, in the South where obesity rates tend to be a little bit higher or is that really kind of a universal nationwide problem? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's a, that's a question that I'm interested in, in answering. Uh, regrettably, in Dr. Lesser's survey in 2006, he didn't look at that or at least he didn't share that in the publication. But I'm really interested to learn uh, if that's uh, a variable. And from what I'm seeing early on as we're collecting data, um, I'm starting to, it, it's, it's starting to look like many of these fast food restaurants that are still existing are, are concentrated in, in the South. Um, but we're, we're still in the, in the process of collecting data. I can tell you we have about 192 medical schools across the country. Currently, as of today, we have responses from 125. So we're still working to get um, those final schools in. But I'm really excited once we have all of those results, I'd love to come back, Chuck, and, and share them with you. Oh, you know our, our exam room is they love some data. So if you want to do a big old data dump on that, let's absolutely make that happen. We will definitely do a big old data dump. <laughs> um, last year, uh, we did something kind of clever here at the Physicians Committee, and we, we released our list of the sickening six, okay? And these are the six most unhealthy fast food items that you want to avoid um, if ever you find yourself at a fast food restaurant. Now, um, I would like Dr. Stancic to tell you what the item is, give you a little bit of background for its nutrition value, and then just as a physician, have you tell me whether or not this food should be considered healthy and should it be in a hospital? So uh, you ready to play? 
I'm ready to play. All right. Number one is the Burger King hand breaded crispy chicken sandwich, which comes in at almost 900 calories with a total of 48 grams of fat, 10 of which are saturated, uh, nearly 100 milligrams of cholesterol and a whopping 695 milligrams of sodium. With that tale of the tape, Dr. Stancic, should Burger King's hand breaded crispy chicken sandwich be served in a hospital? Absolutely not. So this is, you know, these foods, and I'm going to guess that I'm going to have to say no to all of your six. These foods are um, loaded with uh, sodium, loaded with fat, saturated fat. These are, are foods that are promoting cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity. Um, we have ample evidence that um, poor diet is also fueling cancer, Alzheimer's disease, this autoimmune disease epidemic that we're witnessing before us. Um, these foods do not belong in hospital settings. They are deficient of the, the key components of a healthy diet, right? Which are, of course, fiber uh, um, and the importance of phytonutrients and phytochemicals that are so important in regards to their anti-inflammatory effects to maintain health within the cell. Uh, so these these foods have no business being anywhere near uh, hospitals, and yet, um, geez, we as I said, um, we see this every day, uh, current day, and we need to bring attention to it to end these deleterious relationships because um, I think the average individual Chuck doesn't really connect the dots between the dietary choice and the prostate cancer or the dietary choice and, and Alzheimer's disease. And we need to convey those all important messages to our patients because they're currently not receiving it. They're not hearing it from their doctors. And that's because their doctors are not learning it in medical school. So that's why the work that we're doing here at PCRM is so important. It's not only uh, conveying the messages to medical students and nursing students and healthcare professionals, but it's also communicating it uh, on a grand scale to our to our communities so that so that we create again this awareness and this understanding that we're not um, you know uh, enslaved by our genes that I, I think there's so many of us believe that our genetic predispositions are are uh, undeniably going to be our future that in fact uh, our choices the choices that we make each day, are the most important factors in regards to our clinical health outcomes. Uh, and that should be empowering for, for the great majority of us, right? So um, it's not that we, our choices are, are, are unimportant, they're, they're, they're primary. And, and by making good choices each day, we can allow ourselves to live our life to our fullest potential, uh, ideally free of chronic disease. That is my hope for each and every one of us, that we, age gracefully, free of pain and suffering. You know, I, I've been practicing medicine over nearly 30 years now, and I've seen so much pain and suffering throughout my career that I know is largely preventable. Um, my hope is that on that last day on planet Earth, because we're all going to die, we're all going to move on, but on that last day that we enjoy our family, our friends, clear of mind, free of dementia, and then we go to bed and we pass away peacefully with dignity and respect that there isn't that um, regrettable you know, bookend of suffering that we see so commonly in our country where we're in an ICU uh, intubated or in a nursing home suffering. That does not have to be um, the norm. And I think that's what we're witnessing. Like, like it's been almost accepted as that's, that's the way life ends. And that should not be the case. We, we should live our lives we should, largely free of pain and suffering. And, um, and we, we can empower patients. We have uh, so much knowledge and understanding and, and we need to convey that message. One one hundred percent. You know, I, I love that that idea. And I think that, you know, people still need to open up their eyes and, and realize that, it, as you said, like, you know, 80 percent of these diseases are preventable, which means that largely we have the power within us, as you just said, to make sure that that doesn't happen, you know, um, and, and that genes do not have to be your destiny. But you know, you can still manifest that unhealthy destiny um, if you continue to eat 
these sickening six. Um, the, the I just want to finish up because I'm sure that there are people who are listening or, or watching and saying, well, what are the other ones? Yeah. Uh, the the If you're a fan of the spicy chicken sandwich at Burger King, fear not, that also made the list. Um, but here's an interesting one as well. Um, now you're talking about Wendy's bourbon bacon cheese uh, burger, right? So um, you don't just have the beef, the fat, the cheese there, you also are adding that bacon component. And you talked about bacon and eggs being served in hospitals every yeah. single morning. This one, if something has a carcinogen in it, such as bacon, which the World Health Organization has come out and classified as a group Process one carcinogen. Meat. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, like, Again, so you know what? It, it just doesn't. I mean, it, it's a group one carcinogen, not unlike tobacco, right? It's in the same category. And we're feeding hospitalized patients this food today, Chuck, not 20 years ago, but today. Right. Um, we it, it's it's incongruent with um, with health. It's unacceptable. Uh, and we need to, you know, um, bring attention to it. Uh, it's, it's just, from mountaintops. <laughs> it should be. What, the, it should be the cover. It should be the 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 headline in every newspaper. Again, uh, it it should be because literally, if you're grouping it in the same classification as tobacco, yeah. like, and this is coming from the World Health yeah. Organization, yeah. that would be something that every hospital should be paying attention to, right? I mean, you would think. And yet it's regularly on the menu and it goes largely unquestioned. And I think that the real issue is that it's not a stretch also, Dr. Stancic, to imagine that if a patient sees something on a menu in their hospital bed, they will automatically assume that it's a healthy food. I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that unless they're schooled up and they've taken the time to do the research, but I'm not going to question whether or not something's healthy. If it's on a hospital menu, for goodness sakes, I, that to me is even more concerning. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, that would be the natural assumption. You're, you're, you're within a safe haven. I would, I, I would think that the average patient would think that I'm in a hospital setting. I'm here to heal. Here's the menu. Oh, bacon that must be an acceptable option. Uh, but we know that's not true. Uh, we know that uh, these foods are processed foods. And as you said, the WHO has categorized this as a group one carcinogen. And it's not just um, bacon. They're, you know, every hospital that, that I visit has a deli counter where they're, you know, ham sandwiches. And again, and, and they're preparing them and they're sending them off to it's not just the visitors in the cafeteria, but these are foods that are being served in the hospital room in inpatient settings, diabetics that are there with diabetic ketoacidosis. We see um, patients that are, are admitted um, on chemotherapy and they're, they're fueling on these foods because it's about getting calories in, but these are not healthy calories. We, mm. want, we want these foods to be healing and support patients on, on the process of recovery, not not to actually contribute to uh, to damage, uh, but again, uh, this really the root cause to all of this uh, starts in how we train physicians and how we train healthcare professionals. This is a primary uh, message or lesson that needs to be introduced uh, day one. And this should be reiterated throughout the course of their training. And currently it is not at all spoken to, which right. is um, such a missed opportunity. So we have physicians that are incredibly well-trained out practicing um, and by no fault of their own are unable to speak to this. I mean, the, uh, the average oncologist is not learning about the importance of nutrition to not only prevent the disease, uh, we know so much of, for example, breast cancer and prostate cancer is preventable um, with diet. I mean, it, it's always, it's, it's so interesting to me. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was a, a wonderful paper written by Graham Kolditz, who's a, a breast cancer expert. He's at Washington University. And in this paper, he um, lists all, all the important uh, factors that play a role in the, uh, in the development of breast cancer. And, and he lists 
by optimizing, he speaks to this, by optimizing our lifestyle, a, a, a plant-based diet, exercise, avoiding tobacco, all of those factors, that we could prevent more than 50% of breast cancers, which is amazing. And yet, we don't talk about this. In October, during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, uh, we wear pink and there's some, outside of PCRM, of course, we bring a lot of attention, but I'm talking about the on, on a global scale, there, there are these wonderful campaigns that bring awareness and education to breast cancer. We wear pink and we talk about the importance of, of um, early detection and mammography. All of those things are important, but we don't take the opportunity then to speak to the importance of nutrition. What if we went into elementary schools and high schools and introduced these concepts to young girls early on? Because we know the sooner uh, that risk for breast cancer begins at um, uh, uh, after menstruation, so uh, around the, the period of, of menses. So if we could introduce these uh, ed- these bits of education early on, we can make an incredible difference in the future of these young women. Um, and we're not taking that opportunity today. It's another missed opportunity. No question about it. And uh, really quickly, uh, as we wrap up, the other foods that are on that sickening six, uh, Subway's <laughs> six inch tuna melt, uh, which is just a sodium bomb if there ever was one. Tuna is one of those foods that a lot of people consider to be healthy, but <laughs> surprise, really not. Yeah. Uh, also, Sonic's Twisted Texan Cheeseburger and the Sonic Twisted Texan Footlong Chili Cheese Coney. Boy, that just sounds like a heart attack wow. waiting to happen. Get this, uh, 1,190 calories, 85 grams of fat, 24 saturated grams, uh, 120 milligrams of cholesterol, and uh, 2,390 milligrams of sodium. That wow. is a heart stopper right there. And yeah. uh, you, know, yeah. you know, Chuck, the, 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 the most common fast food restaurants that Lesser reported in 2006, you want to guess what they were? Inside Mc, of hospitals, McDonald's, Burger King, Subway. I would say perhaps in that order. <laughs> yeah, number one was Krispy Kreme. No, really? Yeah, yeah. which I've never seen a crisp. Have you seen a Krispy Kreme in a hospital? But it was number one in 2006, followed by Subway, and then Burger King and McDonald's. So you were right. Wow, wow. I had no idea Krispy Kreme had that kind of stroke. Interesting. Interesting. Here's a question. Uh, if you're watching this right now, you're in an exam room who's tuned in, leave a comment and let us know if there's a hospital in your area that has a Krispy Kreme or a fast food restaurant in there. We would love to know about this. Uh, or you can send me a message on Twitter or Instagram. I am at Chuck Carroll WLC. Um, final question for you, Dr. Stancic. Any idea when you might expect uh, your updated survey to be completed? I know these things take time, so I don't want to put you on the clock. Yeah. Um, just a well, rough I'm, ballpark. I'm hoping by the end of the summer, we'll have data that we can share with you. All right. Well, when that <laughs> data is ready, we are ready for the data dump. So, Dr. Sri Stansik, thank you so very much. An important topic and one that uh, I'm so very proud to share with everyone on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.